We're so excited and glad to be starting our new series today in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, titled Sojourners, uh, meaning travelers. We're going to be talking about the fact that we are not of this world. Uh, incredible, incredible book of the Bible. So we'll be going through that over the next uh, few months. Before I begin our message today, before we go into scripture, I want to lay, um, kind of lay out the table a little bit and put some perspective on what is happening in this book, to whom Peter is writing, um, just to kind of see the big picture view of what's happening before we go into the text itself. And I want to begin with uh, a very simple question. What would you say to somebody, maybe a friend or somebody you know, a coworker? What would you say to somebody who was about to go into a, an important but perhaps fatal mission or situation? What would you say to that person before you let them go and, and, and they set off on this quote unquote journey? I know when I used to work construction as a kid, uh, as a kid, as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, it was my first job. Um, and uh, one of the first job sites we go to, the foreman comes up to me. You know, I'm walking around with the uh, nail gun. You know, it's so cool. And uh, he comes up to me. He's like, all right, Pete, what's the golden rule of construction? And I'm like, do unto others as you would do on, you know? He's like, nope, that's not the golden rule of construction. He says, it's very simple. He says, 10 fingers, 10 toes, end of day. <laughs> don't lose a finger, don't lose a toe. That's the golden rule of construction. And obviously I go and like hit myself in the <laughs> hand with a nail gun, so that wasn't fun. But that's the golden rule of construction. Listen, watch out for your safety. You know, when they send you off onto the job site, make sure you've got your hard helmet on, hard hat on, uh, make sure you've, you know, you've got proper gear. Just stay safe out there. What else do you say? I'll give you another example. This was the most decorated Marine in United States history who became a lieutenant general in the Korean War, surrounded by Chinese troops to all sides. There is a famous saying, as his little platoon is surrounded, he says, man, the enemy is on our right, <coughs> the enemy is on our left, they're in front of us, they're behind us. He looks at his men and says, well, they can't get away from us this time. He's surrounded, and he's saying, we, we've got him right where we want him. And he fights out of that situation, surprisingly enough, alive. What do you say to a person that's going off on a mission like that? Maybe somebody who's going into imminent death. You think about the Fukushima a nuclear power plant and maybe hearkening back to the Chernobyl power plant when everything is melting down and you're looking at these men, volunteers perhaps, firefighters, medical personnel, engineers, and saying if somebody doesn't go in there, we're all doomed. What do you say to those men that are going to go in there and you know you're sending them to their death? But somebody's got to do it. What do you say to that guy at that point? What do you say to a firefighter that's about to walk into the World Trade Center as it's collapsing? What do you send to the first person we're going to send to Mars as we launch him into space and, and you understand that if something goes wrong, nobody's going to hear you scream in space as you suffocate? What do you say to a Marine squad as you send them off into some far corner of Afghanistan to support another squad that's been shot up and is almost gone? And they're going to be stationed out there now. What do you say to those guys? What do you say to a pastor that you're going to send to Iraq or Afghanistan, to that very same village where that squad was shot up maybe because he's going to speak the word of God to those people. What do you say to that guy? How do you encourage him? What do you tell him in that moment? The book of First Peter is precisely what we would give an arm a pastor such as that, a believer such as that. 
You have to remember, as Peter is writing this from Rome out to these churches in Asia Minor, that's exactly what they were going through. Peter, just to set the scene in the historical context, Peter, we believe, is in Rome as he's writing this to the persecuted believers, you know, and it's, it's an area a little bit bigger than the size of California, but it's very sparse. There's not a lot of population there, and you've got these Roman colonies that have been put all around this area along major trade routes, and a lot of times what would happen is the Christians would be persecuted in Rome. We understand that. The bigger cities, Athens, Corinth, they would be persecuted there, and what would they do? They would flee the cities just like they flew, fled from Jerusalem when the persecution was there. They would run away from these cities and they would say, listen, I'm getting persecuted in San Francisco. I'm going to go down to Lodi. I'm going to go down to Yuba City, somewhere else, right? A smaller town. I'll go up to Eureka. But all of a sudden, as they're fle- fleeing from maybe Corinth or Athens and they're going to, for example, Galatia or Pontus, right? They're going to this small town, this colony, looking for religious freedom, a lot like the pilgrims did when they fled Europe and came to Massachusetts and and the East Coast. And they're looking for religious freedom, and little did they know that 50 years from then, thereabouts, many of these colonies will begin to persecute these people as well. And they will become centers of persecution, where now they're facing persecution there as well. And living in these troubled times when you would be scorned by your neighbors on a good day or maybe put in jail and killed on a bad day, what do you do? History tells us that the Romans would persecute believers on many different points, but mainly two. They would call them atheists. Can you believe that? Atheists. Because they didn't believe in this pantheon of gods and religions that the Romans believed in. And so they would call these believers atheists. They were, oh, you believers are superstition. You believe in this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And also they would accuse them of proselytizing, and I'm saying that right, wrong, I know, uh, proselytizing Romans, meaning you guys are out there speaking to people and converting people into your religion. We don't want that to happen, and it's the exact same thing that's going on in Russia today where the government has just put out this law that if you are found to be speaking and evangelizing in the street, doing anything to bring people into your church, you'll be jailed, or maybe if you're a foreigner, just cast out of the country. So that's the environment they're living in, and it gets worse. I just want to put you in the shoes of a first century believer living in one of these small towns. You fled there for your safety, for the sake of your family. But one morning you open your front door, maybe on your way to work, and on it there's graffiti that says, leave or die. Leave or die, you atheist. You don't honor Zeus. You're a disgrace to this community. We look into the lives of these believers as we walk with them, you know, step by step, and we see that they face, their businesses would be shunned. They would lose their jobs. Their kids kicked out of school. Any social benefits, government benefits declined. They would have no support. It's graffiti on their walls. I mean, just being shunned by their neighbors. Their property seized. And on top of that, you think, man, I'm a believer. God's going to take care of me. You're still going to fall sick. And there might still be a natural disaster. And something might happen to your crops or your cattle. And you're going through this life and it goes from bad to worse. And your sense of security and your sense of faith and hope and comfort and maybe a sense of uh, relying on the people around you have crumbled completely. Your world is coming down around you. You thought becoming a Christian was a way to something better, and all of a sudden it just gets worse and worse and worse. I want to share with you today the exact words of one of our brothers from that time period. We have a manuscript of a letter written, and he writes the following words. He says, For we Christians... 
are not distinguished from other men by country, nor language, nor the customs which we observe. We inhabit Greek as well as barbarian cities. We follow the custom of the natives in respect to clothing and food and the rest of their ordinary conduct. We're just like them in so many ways. But here's what differentiates the Christians. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, yet endure all things as if foreigners. They marry as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. That's a very interesting comment on abortion from the first century. They have a common table, but not a common bed, a.k.a. they don't sleep around. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are poor, yet make many rich. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Those are the words of a man that's been through it all. And in defending his Christian faith as he writes these words, he says, I don't get it. I don't get it sometimes. We pass our days on earth, but every time something happens, every time we go through difficulty, we're reminded again and again that we're citizens of heaven. And so Peter, as we come back to our text, Peter is writing this to these people where their kingdom, their little sense of security, their bubble of safety and comfort is crumbling around them. And he writes to them the most essential thing you could say as they go off into danger. He says, here is what you need to take with you, the most essential information. Martin Luther calls it one of the noblest books in the Testament, a paradigm of excellent, all that is necessary for a Christian to know, and that is 1 Peter a pastor friend of mine said, if I was going to take one book of the Bible with me to a remote deserted island, it would be this book, the book of First and Second Peter. And so I think what we have before us is truly a blessed, blessed series. And let's open up our Bibles. We're going to begin from First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to actually read the first nine verses, but I'm going to focus on the first two. I just want to give us a little bit of context. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Paul writing this to the persecuted church. Read this, please, right now, as if you are part of that persecuted church. Read this. I don't know what you have to get into your mind, but maybe think about it if you were maybe an Asian believer today or in India being persecuted, and Paul is writing this to you as a persecuted church member. This is what Paul would say to you. He would say, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter. Was I saying Paul the whole time? Oh, man. So, anyway, we'll have to edit the video a lot. (laughs) Peter writes this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and I'm going to include in here, if you're in Asia, or in India today, or in places of South America and Africa, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this You rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, You love him. 
Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want to add to that a passage from John 17, 16. They are not of the world, Jesus prays to his Father, just as I am not of the world. The words of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We begin with verse 1. And I want to begin with a verse, of, uh, with a simple, simple phrase. Elect exiles. Elect exiles. It's really an oxymoron if you think about it because on the one hand, you're special and chosen. On the other hand, you're banished and unwanted. And so in that one phrase, Peter captures in this message to his brothers out there, he says, I understand that you are believers but I also understand the difficulty, the exile that you seem to be facing right now, the trouble that's going on. I understand the temptation you have right now to abandon your faith. You're thinking right now, how much longer can this go on? Every night you pray, oh Jesus, come faster, sooner. I don't know if we can handle this anymore. This is difficult. God, why me? I've been trying to run and I've been trying to find a, hope, a sense of hope in this world. And it gets harder and harder and harder. I think the message that Peter can, that speaks here is very simple. If I could summarize it in a sentence uh, to make it more memorable, I wrote it out this way. It, if life seems short, it hurts or is bland, you know you're from a different land. Sometimes life seems short. Sometimes it does hurt. Sometimes it does seem bland. In 19, oh sorry, 1846, former President John Quincy Adams, uh, lying on his deathbed from a stroke, somebody came up to him and asked him, hey, how are you feeling? How's your health? And he had this famous answer. He said, I inhabit a weak, frail, Decayed tenement, battered by winds, broken up by storms, and from all I can learn, the landlord does not intend to repair it. As I live in this house, it's breaking down. The landlord's not helping me out. I think he wants to take me out somewhere. And for some of you that are older in the audience right now, you're thinking, I get that. I know what he's going through. The body's starting to break down a little bit, you know? Young girls don't look at me the same way as when I was 50 years younger. It looked a lot better back then, right? Maybe, maybe some of you are still good looking at 60. I don't know, like Brother Mike over there. <laughs> but we understand as we get older, things happen. Now, younger people, you don't understand that. You're like, I'll be young forever. A pastor, friend, um, I said, um, I, said I, I think it kind of hit me home. He said, we had a young person in our church, young man, a teenager, 16, 17 years old, uh, gunned down. And I was there at his funeral, he said. The young man is in this casket up front. And that's heartbreaking in and of itself. But he said the worst part was there in the front row was this kid's, was this guy's young brother. I mean, the guy could have been more like eight, nine, ten years old. And he's sitting there and he's looking at his brother there. And he's just crying the whole service and snot all over his suit and his face. And in that moment, you see this kid's life, just his world is falling down around him because he's realizing that, man, life will not go on forever. This happens, people die. There's an end to all of this. And he's looking at his brother there in the casket and it's hitting him hard in that moment. As a 10-year-old kid, he's realizing what's happening. Man, that's a rough time to find out. 
that life doesn't go on forever. That's a tough way to see, to see it and figure it out. Life is short. Not only is life short, it hurts. It hurts. Man, how many, how many stories do we have? Ladies, you'll, you'll relate to this, especially if you're a mom. And we all probably know at least somebody that have maybe lost a baby prematurely early on at some point in that first year. One lady was saying, she has a believer, she said, I, I lost my baby, you know, right after birth, after two heart surgeries, the heart still failed. And she said, I had so many questions about God in that moment. People looked at me on the outside, they thought I was fine, but if they could see me in the evenings when I would have to take a walk out of the house, through the woods in the back of our house, that I was just screaming, and people would say, you're crazy. It took me a long time to get over that, to get through that. Life hurts. A pastor was talking about that moment when he got the verdict. He said he was sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor just said to him, there's no doubt about the diagnosis. There's no doubt. So are you sure I have cancer? He said, yes, we are positive you have cancer. He said, in that split moment, the life expectancy of my, what I thought I would live dropped by 10 to 20 years in that one second. What do you do in that point as you wrestle with the truth that we are mortal, that life hurts, that some of us may die in our sleep, but others may die in agony as we deal with sickness and disease? Folks, the reality is this room has a 100% mortality rate. Everybody in this room will be deceased. What do you do? You realize life is short. You realize life hurts. But some of you, and we realize this on a daily basis for some of us, it's also bland. Sometimes it lacks meaning. I don't know about you guys, but every once in a while I'll wake up in the morning, you know, after a late night perhaps, and you're thinking, why am I even doing this? Why am I even getting up? What's the purpose of all this? And for most of us, we, we get up and we're like, all right, I'm an adult. I've got to handle this. I've got a family that, I, that relies on me. And you keep adulting and doing your thing. And, but maybe then again in the evening as you're going to bed and you're thinking, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of all this? A nurse that... Uh, took care of patients in palliative care, which my understanding is when they're let home from the hospital to just die at home surrounded by their family. She said, as I would take care of these patients all around a town, there was one thing in common. She said, all my male patients would voice one regret before they would die. Every male patient I took care of said, I wish I had worked less. I wish I had worked less. Spent more time with family and church. Spent more time with things that are eternal instead of temporary. And as they saw eternity staring them in their eyes, they would say, I wish I had worked less. Some of us and some believers deal with depression. And it is no secret there is mental illness and some of us face that face to face, whether in our families or in our lives or in people that we know. And there's people that take a different way out of that when life seems bland, when life loses meaning. Pastor Frank Page, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, tells about his daughter's struggle with depression and mental illness and the struggle to find joy in her life. He said, I was getting ready to work in my yard. It was fall. He was going to go rake some leaves. 2009, he says, I get a phone call. It's my daughter, young. She says, Daddy, I love you. Tell Mama and the girls I love them too. And then she was gone. And she took her own life. And as a pastor, as a believer, he struggled with this for years and saying, how do, we, 
How do we give meaning to people's lives? Why did, why did that happen in her life? And how do you deal with that depression? When life seems bland, when life seems meaningless. And you will see people saying, I think, I don't know the purpose of life. We, we live to die. Why do we live to die? Why do we live at all then? Folks, that is the reality of life. We're talking about real people and real problems right now. That is the reality of life. It faces believers and unbelievers alike. And so when we face these realities, we say, well, maybe I'll run to Jesus and it'll be all better. And yes, it will be, but then we face additional persecution. I'll give you a quote by Jim Elliott. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You know what he was talking about there? Those were the la- his, I don't, I'm not going to say those were his last words, but those were the words he said as he and his um, fellow brothers went down to Ecuador to preach to a tribe that had not been reached with the gospel yet, only to be killed as soon as they met him. All four or five of them. And you say, really, God, that's, that's the plan you had for Jim? That's on top of everything he has to deal with and life and all the issues, you're going to send him down to South America and let him be killed? We understand what the consequence of sinning is. We all know Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What are the consequences of not sinning? What if I told you that the consequences of not sinning could also be death? Here on earth, physical death because that's what Jim faced a member of the DC talk Christian band had a great quote he said some Christians haven't even attempted to think about whether or not they would die for Jesus because they haven't even been really living for him we don't even think about hey if persecution happened what would happen if I had to place my life on the line we don't even think about that sometimes because Maybe we really haven't been living for him. Maybe we haven't faced the reality of what it means to to live for him truly, to reject everything until the world rejects us. And I think all of this, as we go through life, the issues we face, all of this begins to point us to something that maybe this isn't what it's all about. Maybe life isn't all that there is. Again, I, I'll tell you a story and, and share with you a quote. Actor Patrick Swayze, many of you know who I'm talking about, was interviewed about a stage four pancreatic cancer. And Swayze kind of opens up about what it feels like to discover that you have cancer, to know that your life expectancy has dropped. And he says, there's so much fear here. I'm scared. And yes, I'm angry. And I'm asking, why me? He says, it's made me think about the afterlife. I don't know what's on the other side. It tests everything I believe in. That here, there is something unique in all of this. Something greater that does not die when I die. And I quote C.S. Lewis when he says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing else in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. As we go through life, as it beats us up, as we go through all of this, we begin to realize, it begins to dawn on us that we are exiles here. We were not created for this world. We were not made for earth. We were made for something bigger And I think that's what (coughs) Peter refers to. Even as he calls them exiles, he says, you are treated, this world is treating you poorly. And that is the way it should be. And it will remind you that you do not belong here. We are from a different land. We are from a different land. And so he begins to set the expectations, folks. It's so important to have the right expectations. And as he goes through all of this, he says, uh, it's not like, Hey, I told you guys about Jesus. Oh, what, you're being persecuted? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. My bad. Or I didn't realize that would happen. He lays it out. He says, it's going to happen. Tough times are coming. Tough times are coming. 
It's important to set that expectation, and I think he does. I mean, when we, I recently had to fly out to Denver, and the pilot gets on the PA and says, guys, be careful, it's going to get seriously bumpy. Uh, sorry, that's when I was flying out of Denver. We were flying into Denver, and the pilot said no such thing, and the plane is like going, we were like getting lifted out of our seats, so everybody is like scared, and, uh, and I hear the steward behind me kind of like, or the, are they still called stewards, stewardesses? Uh, he's like, oh, this happens all the time. So I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. But for the people that didn't hear him, it was scary for them. You, you want to set that expectation, right? You, you tell something to people when they're going off on a dangerous mission. And um, it, it's sad when we, when we don't set the right expectation. What, what did people say when the Titanic left? You know, when, when somebody's, they set off and there was a party and nobody had their expectation of what could possibly happen. And so Paul does set the expectation. He said, I need you to understand, a life will get tougher. It will not be easier. It will get worse. Persecution can happen. And so as he launches into this message, he says, I need you to focus on something else. Yes, you are exiles, but you are elected. You have eternal priorities. Your priorities are not of this world. They're bigger and they will make you different. Somebody writes, we live in strange times, or the times we live in make strangers out of folks like me. I'm not sure. We find ourselves being strangers in this world, and they begin to ask us questions and say, hey, why would you go and spend time with your imaginary friend? Who are you talking to? And then they say, why, are you, why don't you just let us do what we want to do? We're not hurting anybody. Just you do you, and we do me. Why do you <coughs> Why do you let people do that to you? Why don't you stand up for yourself? Why don't you show some pride? Why don't you do what you want to do? Why do you have to constrain yourself? Do you hate yourself? Are you sadistic? That's, it's weird. Why are you disciplining yourself like that? Just have fun. Enjoy life. Party. It only happens once. And folks, here's the truth. If there is no eternity... If there is no eternity, the world is correct. If there is no eternity, every tragedy you go through, that is your tragedy. If every, everything that happens to you, every trial you go through, that is your trial to go to through. Every relationship is your own to deal with. Anything that happens against you, that is your life is your own to deal with. Nobody can help you. This life becomes, at the same time, the most insignificant thing and the most important thing. Insignificant because once it ends, nobody cares about you. You have no eternal meaning. And important because you've only got one life. It ends after 50, 60 years or 20, 30 in some cases, and nobody cares about you either, so you better live it. If there is no eternity, this life is the only thing you've got, and you have no hope for anything more. How's that working out for you? Think about your life right now. There is no eternity. That's all you've got. What you've lived, what you've accomplished or haven't accomplished, that's it. What you think you can accomplish, but the reality is you probably won't achieve all your goals in life. You know, that's the reality. We have high goals, expectations. We'll probably get half of them done. That's it. How's that going to work out for you? There is no eternity. If the world is right, that this is all you have, then it becomes, at one point, the most important thing, and on the other hand, it's just completely insignificant. And folks, the reality is people struggle with this all the time. I went online and found some suicide notes. People that were disillusioned with life people that believed in the lie that this world permeates, that there is nothing after this life here on earth. Here's what they say. I think life is basically pointless. This is all I see of life, waking up to do stuff and reach goals, accomplish things, and then face our inevitable demise. Yep, so we basically live to die. How meaningful. So much sarcasm. Somebody else says, life is like an endless to-do list, and then we die. You do all of these to-do items, and then you die. 
Somebody else says, we're basically, sla- we're basically slaves. Look into the tragedy of this next sentence. My heart sinks each time I see a pregnant woman. Why is she bringing another human into this miserable life? I feel sorry for that kid and for her. What is the purpose of finding joy in life if it doesn't last? And somebody says, I'm just tired of waking up tired. That is what the world offers today. There is no eternity. Live a miserable existence. Live it, because that's all you have. Live it, because there's no more hope than that. Folks, the truth that Peter tells us here is that you are elect. You are made for more than this world. This is not your home. This is not your home. God saves people for eternity, not just for here, for this world. The Bible does not have a concept of you being saved for this world. I'm going to save you for this time. I'm going to save you for now. The Bible doesn't teach that. He says, if I save you, I don't want to save you for 30 years, for 60 years, for 100 years. I want to save you, save you forever, for eternity, till time passes away. And even then, I want to save you till then. And so I want you all to imagine and just stand with me. As life comes to an end, each one of us, we understand, will stand before God. And in that moment, as you stand before God, close your eyes if you want to, but imagine that moment as time and space passes away. Nothing that we know about physics works anymore because he is above physics, above this universe, above anything we know, in a completely different dimension of anything that we know. You're standing before a being that is older than time itself, and yet it's only being getting started. That is wiser than this universe knowledge combined impossibly powerful and you're going to stand before that being and you're going to give an account for your life what are you going to brag about then what do you think has eternal value in that moment as you look through your life as it as it's displayed maybe before you as it's recollected What is of value in your life, believer? As somebody who's been called elect, and then we go through and we realize that, hey, all that time spent online, that's temporary. But the time spent in prayer, that was eternal. That had eternal value. Your kid's education It's temporary. But your kids' souls are eternal. Whether you're sick or healthy, that's temporary. But how you glorified God through that sickness, that is eternal. Your goals today, your dreams, aspirations, where you want to work, who you want to marry, where you want to live, where you want to retire. So temporary. God's will for you is eternal. And I read from 1 John 2.17, the world and all of its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. In that courthouse, in that throne room, as we can only describe it in human words because it's so much greater than that, than what we can even imagine, as you stand before that being and your soul is judged, folks, there's so little that is eternal in our lives today. I'll speak for myself first of all. When I realize that, God, what percentage of my life is meaningless to you at this point? What percentage of my life counts for nothing in eternity? 
What little percentage, what little nugget? I mean, I feel like somebody's going to have to be a gold miner, you know, when they take all of this dirt and sift it and sift it and sift it to find a little piece and flick, of just a, a, a little bit of gold. Is that what our life's going to be like when God has to sift through tons and tons and tons of dirt to find the little piece of eternity that we've given him, that we've put in? And all of that will fall away. He says there's so little eternity sometimes that we live for. Even though we were never made for this world, we were made for a different world. And so God encourages us here. The Spirit encourages, encourages us through Peter and remind us again, he says, you have been chosen. You are elect. You have been chosen for something greater. And we see that. He says, you are elect for what? You have been chosen to be cast out. You have been chosen to be uncomfortable. You have been chosen to operate by a different set of rules. You have been honored to no longer fit in. You have been graced to be misunderstood. Your heart will grieve when others don't. You will bleed when others don't care. You will pursue things that others reject. That is the life you have been chosen to, believer. That is what is eternal. And then we read verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God. He has foreknown all of this. He knows what's going to happen. He has seen where you've been. He knows where you're at right now. He knows where he's taking you. Trust him. So many people lose faith today because the world tells them there's nothing more. They say, deal with it. You have to deal with it. Your tragedy is your tragedy. Your pain is your pain. There is no father above. And generation of generation of peoples fall into that trap. Folks, I'll bring an illustration. There's two ways to react to this. On one hand, and I, and I'll, two people in the same situation, two people in the concentration camps, in the Nazi concentration camps, brutal conditions. And, and as the American uh, liberators came in on the west side and, the, and then the Soviets on the east side, they opened up these camps and some photographers went in and began to take pictures of what was written on the walls. And on one wall in one camp, they find somebody... They find somebody that has written and said, I believe in the sun when it's not shining because it's covered by the clouds. And I believe in a God even when he is silent. But yet on another wall in another concentration camp, they find the words, if there is a God, he will have to beg for my forgiveness. Two perspectives. Two perspectives on what's happening. And that's why we read, God will sanctify you when difficult times come. When difficult times come, Will you be like the person on the, on the one hand who said, God, I know that you're still out there. I know there is eternity. Or are you going to be like the other man that says, God, you will beg for my forgiveness. Why are you doing this to me? How could you exist? You're so cruel. Two perspectives. Peter says, God knows all of that. And God uses all of that to sanctify you. To sanctify you. And the question is, do you believe that your father is out there, that he's known all of this? I was speaking with a young man this week, and I loved his illustration when he said, listen, so many people today, so many people today haven't spoken to their father. They don't know their father. They're so far away from home that they begin to lose hope. And if you haven't spoken to your father in a while, and somebody comes to you and says, your dad's gone. Your dad's no longer there. He doesn't care about you anymore. And many people begin to say, hey, you know what? You may be right. I haven't spoken to him. Who knows what's going on? I haven't seen him work in my life. Maybe that's the truth. But when, when you've been speaking to your father on a daily basis and somebody comes tell you that, hey, your dad's gone, you're like, no, that's not true. I just spoke to him this morning. Here, let me ring him up for you. Listen, he helped me out. We just, we just had breakfast yesterday. We just had, we've communed. I know him personally. And all of a sudden, there's that comfort and peace knowing, hey, he knows me and I know him. 
We have a relationship. He, I know that he's foreknown. I know that he will sanctify. I know that he will take care of me. And here's what happens. I quote John Piper. He says, the devil walks around like a roaring lion. But when he sees that all that damage that he's trying to do to you, all it does is sanctify you before God and make you purer and holier, it makes him domesticated. And the roar becomes a meow. Because anything that he tries to do for you, God turns it for good. And as he attacks you and attacks you and attacks you, God says, I'm going to use this for good. They're going to be sanctified. And then he teaches us obedience. Folks, I don't know how you look. How on, some people say obedience, it's a burden. It's discipline. I would challenge you and say obedience is a gift. If it was not for the freedom that God gave you from sin, there would be no way you could be obedient. If it was not for freedom that he gave you, there was no way you could follow his word and pursue him. You would be ruled by your desires and emotion, but he gives us that freedom to be obedient. And finally, you have been paid for with his blood. We read that, sprinkled with his blood. I quote Pastor Anthony Moore. We'll complete with this and we'll pray. Jesus Christ created time. And then he entered time. And he interacted with humanity during that time. And then he died to save time, to redeem it. And then he leaves time in order to judge time. And ultimately, he will destroy all time so that we can finally have eternity. Time is a temporary concept. As strange as that is to think. Time is only for a set amount of time. God created it. He will destroy it. And he creates eternity. Folks, we are sojourners. We are in this temporary amount of time that God has created for us. And every time life seems hard and difficult. And it hurts and it seems so short and meaningless. All of that is God saying, I want to remind you, you weren't created for this. This is not your home. You're destined for a different land, for a different place that is beyond time. If we could, let's all rise. We're gonna, I'm going to ask the band to come up. I really want us uh, to just take the next minute and stand before God, our creator who is above and beyond time, Let's worship him in our hearts, each person individually. And maybe you can recall situations in your life and pain and hurt and meaningless moments maybe. Can we just give all of that up to God right now and say, God, I get it now. I understood why that happened. I understood what you're pointing me towards. And folks, prepare your hearts for eternity. If you're not ready for it today, if you're not convicted by the Spirit that you are saved today, you need to come up here and we'll pray together and that needs to change. Because your life is short, you have no clue when it ends, nothing's guaranteed, not a single minute, not a single second. But eternity is guaranteed forever, either with God in heaven or as eternal punishment. Let's all close our eyes, folks. Just come before the Lord right now. And I just want to give you a minute to speak with your dad in heaven. Father, I thank you for this opportunity for the church to be together here. For all of us to examine our lives, Father, and I examined mine first of all. And I realize how little I invest into what is eternal. I realize that we place way too much significance on the temporary things and the pleasures of this world and the desires of our flesh. And 
We're always battling that. Father, I pray that you impress on our hearts right now the value, the pricelessness of eternity, of what is to come, because all of this will be destroyed and gone. Dad, we come before you, and we just pray that you have to give that to us. We cannot come upon that ourselves. We don't understand. We can't understand. But through your spirit, Father, work in us. Bring us closer to you. And I pray that we can commune with you so that as this world turns against us, as they see that we have become strangers and sojourners here, that we do not live by their values, that we can at the same time tell them, hey, we know our father. We know our dad. We live with him. We know you, and we cannot wait to see you and be with you, Jesus. Bless us now as we worship. I pray for every heart here this week that we can live it out, live the word out that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.